Alright, so here we have another case. So now this case is in a mandibular area. So yes, as I have presented to you, it's actually oriented this way when it's in man the mandible. But it's going to be very difficult to draw, but I'm going to try to do it this way first. However, or nonetheless, the classification of this case is what? If you have bilateral edentulous spaces that only has a uh, natural dentition on the anterior and no distal or posterior abutment tooth, or also known as a bilateral distal extension case, yes, this is a class 1 case. And for a class 1, there, in this class 1 case, there is no modification space actually. So yeah, let's try to design using just drawing first. Okay, first one that we need to do is actually, again, you do not need to do this, but I prefer doing it because this is my guide. This is to draw what our contact points mark our, I'm sorry, mark our contact points because this is what not freely for your grid work, but whenever you try to draw your pontic would be helpful next is our lingual area this is the second um, parabolic line you need to follow the lingual this is the location of well mostly your finish lines but you're going to see the difference of the finish line in the mandible and in the maxilla when it comes to a free end cases Anyways, next stop of our next parabolic line is what again? The distance from the gingival margin to the major connector in the mandible is what? 3 to 4, right? 3 to 4. So imagine this is 3 to 4. The distance, it's actually more closer compared to maxilla. Right. So there. So first things first, we're going to choose what our path of insertion. Well, of course, our path of insertion is directly over, char. Anyways, depending on our, the tilt of our mm, case. Then, just imagine that this case is in an ideal form, so meaning zero tilt. Amazing undercuts and everything in the most ideal way as possible. Anyways, next up is for us to select our primary abutment piece. And again, primary abutment teeth are those that are almost directly located in our edentulous spaces. Not really almost, but most of the time. But sometimes, depending on the case of the patient, we may opt to not use them. But again, I repeat, this is a ideal state. So meaning we're going to choose our primary abutments as this and this. And... Yeah, yep, we're going to draw our guide planes. So this is my guide plane, and this is my guide plane. Well, actually, this guide plane also functions in the drawing as my minor connector. That's correct. Well, for now, it's a guide plane. Now, knowing that this is a distal extension case, the placement of a rest, which is next, actually differs from that of a bounded. Remember, the bounded case for our case is what? Your rest is directly adjacent to the edentulous area. But if it's distal extension case, where do we usually place our rest? It's actually located where? Adjacent or away from. Try to think for a distal extension case basing on your uh, principles of biomechanics and the property of our rests where do we usually place when it become when it comes to distal extension cases is it adjacent to or away from right it's away from so we're going to place our rest here Knowing that this is a premolar, 
So we're going to use an occlusal rest also in this instance because we need at least two rests for our primary abutments and of course we need to connect that to our major connector using our embrasure minor connector by the way whenever you try to connect a minor connector may it be a strut an embrasure minor connector or a grid work it should always meet your major connector at 90 degrees right 90 degrees now that we have placed our rest we next choose what type of major connector we're going to use and what is the most ideal major connector and yes of course it is our lingual bar and for this instance you do not need to extend your lingual bar until the posterior area you're just going to place your lingual bar at the last minor connector and i told you this guide plane of mine actually functions as a minor connector and what type of minor connector it's actually your proximal plate yep i see you knew it it's the proximal plate hooray well i'm not sarcastic <laughs> anyways so we're gonna draw the superior border of our major connector so mostly it's until here only but let's try to extend a little bit so we extend just a little bit extend and extends then we what course draw this is actually what minimum of four to six millimeters thickness when it comes to a bar because this is what the most ideal type of major connector that we're going to use in the mandible if I have not said it yet I'm sorry it is your lingual bar yep it's only like that so the lingual bar now that we have placed our major connector, next up, your minor connectors. So you already have actually your minor connectors. You just need to... What? Make them meet at a 90 degree angle. Yes. Actually, when you're going to make your wax pattern you're going to make sure that this one meets at a 90 degree angle and reinforce properly there next for a minor connector is actually a what minor connector what is missing and that's correct our grid work so knowing the principle of our grid work whenever it's a distal extension case where do we terminate our grid work in the mandible for distal extension cases is it all the way or two-thirds of the way yes it's just two-thirds of the way so we take this we divide it into three and we end up here we take this we divide it into three and we end up here so yeah we try to Place our grid work as diligently as possible. Your grid work in the mandible actually depends on the shape of your crest. If it's knife edge, this is going to be a little bit what? Smaller. Oh, I'm so sorry. I made it a little bit big. Nonetheless, yep. 
So this is your grid work. Yeah, I always prefer the ladder type or the lattice type because again, the lattice is it gives you the property of most amazing acrylic strength because it can go through and through. Anyways, aside from it terminating two thirds of the way, what is needed in the mandible when it when it comes to the cell extension cases? It's actually your tissue stop yep so you just need to place a little bit of material here at the back to indicate that you have placed your tissue stop mm -hmm. now what is missing is actually your finish lines but this is the thing for the finish lines for a distal extension case in the mandible it's just actually located here at adjacent the last edentulous area so it's just actually here yep and it's extending until your major connector that's why i extended your major connector a little bit this is just your finish line you do not need to place finish line until there no there's no need it's because of the flabbiness of the tissue this is a floor of the mouth compared to the maxilla that is palette. Later, I'm going to show you how it's made in the maxilla. So this is just your finish line. There. Finish line. Next up, what do we need? We have our minor connectors, major connector, your rest. What is missing? Of course, your direct retainers. So, since this is a distal extension case, the direct retainer of choice usually is what? RPI. And we know that RPI is... Let's write this down so that you're going to remember. RPI. This is what? Rest. Proximal plate. And an I bar. But the thing about this is, it's just considered an RPI if your rest is located in the meshal, your proximal plate at the distal, and your choice is an I bar, major a direct retainer. So, therefore, since it fits the criteria and it's the ideal direct retainer of choice in a distal extension case, we're going to use the all um, famous eye bar so we already have our mesh rests prepared here this is my proximal plate at the distal area you just need your eye bar so actually in an eye bar depends your rpi will depend on the location of or what type of tooth that you're going to place an eye bar to if you're going to choose a premolar for an eye bar normally your eye bar would, would uh, eye bar would terminate in the middle or the buccal surface of your premolar mid buccal surface and it's going to gradually curve going to and at least one tooth away from the abutment or posterior abutment and normally it's thicker when it comes from the grid work rather than it terminating right there so we're going to do the same thing here An eye bar this is the most ideal one yep because it's stress releasing and we know that a distal extension case tends to rotate more since there's no posterior abutment so you need stress releasers right there now we have two rpis if you opt to use a reverse circlet in this area and in this area it's actually just okay 
it's just okay oh i showed you my thumb anyways so next up what is the missing component when it comes to a distal extension case a distal extension case is again your class 1 and class 2 kennedy classification so what is the missing component or the the component that we always look into since it tends to rotate into a fulcrum line yes that is your indirect retainer however your indirect retainer is located or placed in the area farthest from your fulcrum point and your fulcrum point is actually the line or fulcrum point or fulcrum line is actually the line made from the most posterior rest positions so this is the most posterior rest position or as indicated in your notes the rest of the most posterior abutment tooth yep so the most posterior rest positions now we connect them with an imaginary line i hope you see it yep and we need to bisect that because you need to locate the one farthest away from so bisect it and yes of course it will land in our incisors but knowing the rule for indirect retention you're not allowed to actually use incisors for indirect retention unless you have no more or no other way of indirect retention or giving indirect retentions so what is the most farthest anterior tooth that can receive an indirect retention it's actually your canines yes it's the canines that is correct however if you're just going to use your canines alone it actually cannot what since this is the mandible it will not be able to ideally be given a cingulum rest seat so if this is the case why cannot we give a mandibular cingulum i mean a mandibular canine a cingulum rest seat it's because of its orientation your mandibular canine actually has an orientation of what in the lingual aspect so this is your mandibular canine so that's the buccal aspect your mandibular canine is too tilted lingually that it has its orientation like this so the cingulum or your line is more tilted going to the lingual your central or center of your tooth therefore you will not be able to minimally reduce this area for it to be uh, useful as a cingulum rest seat you're going to reduce a lot of tooth structures and that is a big no-no unless you're going to what up to add a bonded rest seat if you're going to do that for a bonded rest seat therefore and then you can use a cingulum so let's try to place bonded rest seat using blue you can place the cingulum rest already because this is already the bonded cingulum rest seat okay that's the only time that you can do it or if your mandible or your mandibular canine has a very prominent cingulum that's the only time that you can use it as a cingulum rest seat or prepare it as a cingulum with cingulum rest seat but nonetheless since this is ideal it's not really that ideal to give it a cingulum rest seat therefore we can opt to give it an incisal rest seat but that would be what a little bit more traumatic in a point so i can either opt for a plate in this case i can plate this why plate because an indirect retainer another form of indirect retainer is actually double kennedy bar or even lingual apron but it's not the apron itself but rather the way we're going to prepare the most terminal 
plates or terminal abutments to receive the plates but it's going to entail a lot of coverage so another thing that I can do is not to plate but rather to place the rest in this area so for me to just place it in this area or in this first premolars it's going to be a little bit nearer your major abutment tooth so but uh, so that's a possibility but of course it's less of an indirect retainer but it's better than none so i choose another design for my indirect retainer so i've already given you one one is the plate here another is a sing uh, uh, occlusal rest seat on your premolars at both sides why both sides because this is middle so whatever i do in one side i opt to do in the other but it's better just come to think of it even the distribution or another thing that i could do is actually what to plate only my canines so if i'm just going to plate my canines then although it cannot receive a singular rest seat nonetheless it's still possible so that's number three i can plate my canines so that's possibility number three another possibility is what i can plate my canine and i can connect it in a occlusal rest seat but again it would interfere or it will not follow the rule of utilizing minimal components but it is still however possible so it would depend on what type of indirect retainer that you're going to use in such case but for me i will go to lingual plating just to give you one of the four choices of the um, indirect retainers but if this is an ideal case and I would opt to prepare it in the patient's mouth, I'd rather have bonded receipts. Okay, bonded receipts. But for example, this is a cast and there's no bonded receipt. Therefore, I'm just going to use plating. So how do I plate? I'm just going to connect this. Make sure I prepare this area. Then I plate. Then I connect this. Then I will just follow the singulum area. Yep. So I pleat it. There. So I already have my um, indirect retainer. So since this is a plate, I'd rather shade it along. Because you might confuse it with a double Kennedy bar. Because we have a double Kennedy bar and we would not like that because of food entrapment. So I just shade this out, shade, 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 shade. All right. So there. So we have it plated. Now next, what are we going to do? Of course, we're just going to place our Pontix. So my Pontix is what? A first molar. So I can place first molar and a second molar. Do I need to place a third molar? Of course not. There's no need unless you're opposing upper occlusion or upper dentition. We need or entail you to do so. But of course, knowing the principle of occlusion, it is just your mandibular third molars that have one opposing occlusion. Your maxillary third molar can oppose the mandibular second molar, right? Right? Right. If I'm wrong, just correct me. <laughs> of course, this is videoed. I don't want to repeat anymore. Anyways, you yes, see, place the grooves. And if you want to ask, how is it? How's the feeling of talking to oneself alone in the room? Well, it's not really nice. 
That's why I don't vlog. Oh, no, no. Share ko lang. Anyways, next, we plays our... Of course. Ta -na -na. What's the red thing? Yep. It is our denture base. And normally, our denture base extends up to this. What's that pad? Yep. It is our... It's actually the hardest for me. I don't know how to draw the base in the mandible. <laughs> Let's just try to imagine. Oh yeah, it's supposed to go beyond. Right, I forgot. It's supposed to cover that. <clears throat> What's this? This is the buckle. Um... What table is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you have it in your mind. I forgot. Yeah. Anyways, so that's our design, our principle. When it becomes, when it comes to your denture base, you need to extend your denture base up to your retromolar pad area. You need to cover that fibrous tissue for you to have stability of your denture, and it needs to be in perfect fit. So, do not forget that only your metal will end two-thirds of the way, but your denture base will what? Cover up to the retromolar pad area. Okay, so this is how we design a distal extension for the mandible. <laughs>